morning, everybody, and welcome to Dunwoody. My name is Richard Wagner. I serve as president of Dunwoody College of Technology. It's my honor to welcome you to our C. Charles Jackson Leadership Lecture Series program, which was created by the Alumni Board of Managers. It has been an exciting uh, initiative, and I, I don't know what number we're on here, but we've, we've done quite a few of these. They keep getting better, and uh, we look forward to a great speech this morning. So today we're uh, honored to have Ted Ferrara serve as our keynote speaker. Ted is a 1977 refrigeration graduate of Dunwoody and the chairman and owner of Sandra Heating and Air Conditioning, which is a family-owned business that has been in existence since 1940. The company specializes in residential indoor comfort systems, including heating, cooling, and indoor air quality. Ted is the recipient of the Refrigeration Service Engineer Society John Spence Memorial Award for achieving the highest score in the nation on the Society's cert uh, Certificate Membership Examination, the American Legion School Award given for courage, honor, patriotism, and leadership, and the Dunwoody College of Technology Alumni Achievement Award. Ted holds a BA and a BS in Applied Mathematics from Metropolitan State University and an MBA from Harvard University, but I think Ted still says that his most meaningful education occurred at Dominic College of Technology. I don't need to put words in your mouth, Ted, but I have heard you say that in the past. <laughs> Ted is the past president is a past president of the Dominic College of Technology Alumni Board of Managers and is the immediate past president and currently serves as a member of the Dominic College of Technology Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcoming Ted Ferrer. All right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Good, okay. Well, thank you, Rich, for uh, the warm welcome. And uh, it's great to, to see you all here uh, early this morning. A uh, good sized crowd. A lot of friendly faces, a lot of familiar faces, and some new ones. If you're new to Dunwoody, if you've never been here before, a double welcome. We're just delighted to have you here in Dunwoody's 101st year. I am particularly proud uh, to have a number of colleagues from Standard Heating here uh, with us this morning. There we, there we go. Who themselves, in their own right, in their own way, are, I think, really accomplished terrifically. And who have taught me a lot. And um, I think they represent uh, a group of people, I don't think I've ever worked with a group of people who were more desirous of learning and being, uh, we need a little more volume? Can I have it move just a little bit? There we go. Better. Better? Better. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'll step off from behind here, maybe here. <laughs> uh, I don't think this group of leaders uh, I've never worked with a group that was more desirous of learning and improving the effectiveness of their leadership. And I think that's kind of the gold standard of being a leader, okay? Because really, leadership is a process. And for myself, as a leader, you know, I consider myself a work in process. And I, I choose that term carefully work in process, not work in progress, okay? Because some days it is progress, and other days it's regress, okay? <laughs> but overall, it's a process. And that characterizes, I think, leadership. It's not that proverbial destination. You don't wake up one morning and feel like, okay, I'm not a leader. It's a process, and it can be a very transforming process, particularly for the leader. Um, I've structured my, my thoughts uh, for aimed at those of you who are early on in your leadership path, newer to, to leadership uh, experience, okay? But I hope those of you who are experienced leaders will find something also to take away from this. And I'm going to take the subject of leadership on directly. I don't, I think there is a difference between management and leadership. And as I've kind of thought about what I wanted to 
talk about today, you know, I kept coming back to which was which, management and leadership. There's a lot of crossover between the two. But if I were speaking about management, I would be having a very different talk this morning. So I'm going to focus on leadership, and I'm going to try to be mindful of the <coughs> speakers in this series who have come before me and not covered the same ground. I've been to a number of the Jackson lectures, and I've found them all to be really worthwhile, as I know many of you would feel the same way. And so I'll do my best here this morning to keep, keep in, in that vein. Um, I start with a premise that leadership is difficult. Okay? There's risk involved in leadership. Leadership that matters is what I like to think of as leadership definition. Okay? Um, a lot of what we call leadership is, in my mind, not really leadership. Just because you're a leader or in a position of leadership uh, doesn't mean that you're always engaged in leadership as an activity. Okay, so I'm going to throw out a definition here. But first, uh, the focus of my talk will be developing the leadership mindset. Okay? Uh, that's going to be the dimension of leadership that I'm going to talk about. And the definition, the working definition that I'll have for this is leadership that matters is really helping people get to a place they would not have otherwise been inclined to go. Okay? That to me is leadership that matters. That's consequential leadership. When we think about helping people, okay, which is really, I believe, in the servant leadership model. I believe that is a, there has to be at the core of why you would want to, be, to help others to try to make the world a better place. And how hard is it to lead if what you're telling people is what they want to hear? And just delivering good news. Okay? To me, that's not really that's not really leadership. Okay? It, it's an activity, it, it's sometimes an important thing to do, a good thing to do. But is it really leadership? It might be just informing people. It could be being a tour guide, right? Telling you what you want to hear. Real leaders tell people what they need to hear more than what they want to hear. And it, again, it can be a trans transformational experience. And I will say, lives depend on leadership. Look at the headlines. Look at the headlines locally. Look at the headlines really nationally what's going on in this political season, right? Some of the events that have taken place and uh, maybe the news media isn't kind of the standard I'd want to lay out there for, for what we ought to be paying attention to because there's a lot of good leadership going on that we don't see. But I think, uh, when I think of the headlines, where is the leadership? Leadership that matters. Leadership that's aimed at helping people get to a place they wouldn't have otherwise been inclined to go. Okay. So along those uh, lines, I have come up with five things I wanted to talk about today. Okay. The first, the first three are what I would call uh, elements of the mindset of an effective leader. Someone who leads, leads well, and can do so sustainably. And the last two are kind of to-dos, tasks, or tactics, if you will. 
that a good leader tends to very early on. Okay. So the first one, on the path of becoming a good leader, on the path of developing that, that leadership mindset, be a good follower. Okay? This is the proving ground for good leaders. Be a good follower. So what do we mean by be a good follower? What do I mean by uh, being a good follower? And why does this matter? I think there's a misperception about followership, that it's a passive activity. Being a good follower is by no means passive. OK? People sometimes think that, well, if I'm a good follower, I just kind of keep my head down, I don't make trouble, and I, you know, get my job. Okay? Do what they tell me to do. That's not being a good follower. Being a good follower is very active. It, it in, requires you to be very engaged. Okay? To understand not only what's expected of you, but why it's expected of you. And more importantly, to push back when you think, when you either don't understand it or don't agree with it. To push back appropriately, respectfully, but to push back. Your job as a follower, if you're a good follower, is to help ensure that your leader is successful. Okay? Because the bigger effort that you're undertaking requires that. So, good followers help make sure that the leaders don't fail. Good followers try to see that bigger picture. All right? And I think that's why that is what good followership is. Why is it important as kind of a preamble to developing the proper leadership mindset? It is, I think, a very effective way of understanding what it is you're asking when you become a leader, what it is you're asking of your followers. Because you've been one. It helps you develop empathy. And I think there, that's a, a, a crucial element of being an effective, sustainable leader. So I would hope that um, you would agree that being a good follower is a necessary preamble to becoming a good leader. And the mere fact that you ask the question, what is being a good follower, can put you on the path to becoming a good follower. Okay? A reality check test for all of us is to ask ourselves, would I want me as a follower? And this is a lesson that I actually learned quite a bit later in my career. This was not something that came to me early. When I graduated Dunwoody, I went to work for a family business. My father was my boss. You know, you, you interact with your father as a boss a whole lot differently, right? You do a lot of complaining, just like at home. You know, that's not being a good follower. In 1998, my brother Todd and I sold our company. And we became part of a much larger national organization. We were now, for the first time in my career, I now had someone I had to report to who had someone they reported to who had somebody they reported to. We're now kind of in the corporate structure. And that's where I learned some of the elements of being a better follower. Okay? But I hope for you, for you younger, newer leaders, that you learn this part about being a good follower earlier on. Okay? So, uh, one, one element, I think, of uh, um, nurturing and becoming, developing that uh, 
leadership mindset. Next one, take ownership. Leaders take ownership. It's about defining and, and broadening responsibility. Okay. Take ownership. Leaders take ownership. It's about going beyond just the mere job description or your understanding of the duties that you have. To kind of look more broadly, interpret more broadly your areas of responsibility. As a leader, your job is to assure the best outcomes possible. And in order to do that, sometimes you've got to be the one who makes sure nothing slips through the cracks. And those of you who've had a lot of leadership experience, you can see inherently the value of this. You take ownership. When you're given an opportunity or a problem, you grab onto it again, and you don't let go. Okay? You own that opportunity. It is, I think, kind of the most effective defense against short-termism, okay? You've maybe heard that initialism, IBG, YBG. Heard that one before, IBG, YBG? It's the bankers used to use it back in the old days prior to the crisis. Hey, why worry about it? I'll be gone, you'll be gone. <laughs> you take ownership, you're never gone, okay? You are never gone. <laughs> the, your cause, your organization, is an extension of yourself. Then you ought to act like it. You're an owner. Okay? And that is a very, very powerful, effective way to lead. So the question there, the reality question there, for those of us taking ownership, is to say, well, what would the legal owners, the shareholders, what would they want me to do? And you act accordingly and you won't go wrong. Okay? So, take ownership. It's about going beyond. Right? Now there is one caveat I should put out there when, when we talk about taking ownership. And that is, don't make the mistake of taking on every single problem, every single issue, every single opportunity that comes within your realm. Right? Sometimes people will come to you with a monkey. And you gotta say, hey, you know, you need to keep that monkey on your back. You have a problem? Let me help you with that problem, but I'm not going to take that problem away. Because that's disempowering the people, and it is a sure way for you to get bogged down. So there's a caveat to taking ownership. You take ownership to assure outcomes. That doesn't mean that you yourself are the one who solves every problem, takes on every duty. Okay? So, caveat to that one. Next item. No excuses. No excuses. Um, as a leader, you take ownership, and there should be one thing in your head, right from the start. No matter what, this opportunity I'm going to make the most of it, and there are no excuses. No matter what the outcome is, we don't allow that. I have found in my experience, people who have experience in the military are particularly good with this. They understand when they're given a mission, they get the mission done, they don't make excuses afterwards. Now, we understand sometimes when you have an undertaking, a particularly difficult one, that things don't always work out. Sometimes, they're failures. And so there can be reasons why things don't work out. But don't mistake a reason for an excuse. An excuse takes you off the hook, relieves you of your responsibility. That you should, must never let happen. Okay? Sometimes things don't work out. There are reasons for it. But the no excuses mindset, when you really adopt it, is very, very empowering. 
you motivate at that point a whole set of resources, some of which you may not have even known you had. You unleash a lot of creative problem solving and focus a lot of energy on making the most of the opportunities that you're engaged in. So the no excuses. I guess the way I would characterize it, and I, this one, this is this is a hard one. If you know, you might even be able to say, okay, yeah, I buy that, but do you really buy it? Because th this is painful. You know, leadership is difficult. This is a hard one. Your ego is going to take a lot of hits when you don't have excuses. Okay, but you set yourself up for success. It's like it's like a football team when it, when, it, when you don't have excuses. It's like being on a football team and being able to put your offense and your defense on the field at the same time. You, know, you could lose the game, but probably not because you don't give yourself the effort and you motivate and bring out the best in yourself and others. And people respect that. I mean, in the end, you know. Why would you want to sell something nobody buys? And that's what excuses are. Nobody buys excuses. Get it out of your vocabulary. Get it out of your head. Okay? It's a very, very powerful concept. The reality question there is, okay, if something works out or doesn't work out, whatever the results are, you ask yourself, okay, if I had a duo, could I have changed the outcome and made it better? Okay? When you have no excuses, that's, that's your reality. Particularly if, if, if something you're working on doesn't work out. Could I have changed it? Knowing what I know after the fact. may not be a fair question, but it's a leadership question. And as I said, leadership is not easy. It's hard. It's risky. It extracts a cost. But it also offers a tremendous benefit to us. All right, now the next two items, I got kind of the first three principles here. You know, be, do, and don't do. Okay? So now we'll move on to my, uh, my last two points uh, this morning, and they're kind of uh, more to do. Define reality. Early on, a leader's job is to figure out where the organization, where your people are at, and help them understand that reality. Where are we at? What are we capable of? I have seen a number of instances over my career in which I've, again, had plenty of failures and plenty of successes seen a number of instances where leaders have missed on this. They haven't taken enough time to really help people understand. To go through that iterative process of understanding, okay, here's where we're at. And whether it's a successful operation where everything's going great or a turnaround situation, as a leader, early on, you need to define reality. You need to help people understand where we're at. For the sake that everybody has to have that common understanding and planning going forward to figure out, okay, have we got an effective plan? But the other thing it does for you as a leader, you, you gain confidence. The confidence of your followers. I can't tell you the number of times I've, I've, I've you know, had a, in a leadership situation where I was the follower, and the leaders laying out a vision or you know coming up with 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 a plan and you think this person has no clue all right because have you all been there I mean, right and that that you, you, that is just an unforgivable mistake early on okay define reality I mean, how can you know where you're, you know, whether the plan to get where you want to go is, makes any sense if you don't know where you're starting? Okay. okay, and so the last item I want to just hit on is a very, very 
powerful one, to lead with values. <coughs> I apologize, I kind of, it's low on the screen, I hope, I hope everybody has, can see it, but to lead with values. That is your strongest hand as a leader, okay? What I would say is, in an uncertain world, this is where you find certainty, okay? This is the basis upon which you build everything else in your organization. This is the strongest hand you have, and it's the strongest hand you can give your followers to understand, to articulate, and come up with a set of values, core values, that you operate from. People will, they will, follow you when you articulate and you believe and you live the right kind of values. And so what I've done here is I've just kind of taken an example um, from, from my company. Uh, this is a kind of a recent document. I pulled this out uh, as just an example of, of our core values. And by core values, uh, what I mean to say is these are not all the values we have or hold in our company. But they're the ones that boil down are the essence, really, of what defines who we are and how we conduct ourselves. Okay? They don't change with the winds. They cost sometimes. But they also deliver a whole lot more value than they are the values that if you took one of them away, you wouldn't have the same company. We wouldn't be who we are. And so that, I think that's a, a very strong, strong hand. Um, it is a source of competitive advantage. It's a source of strength for you as a leader to figure out what are your values and how do they mesh with the organization and those around you? Okay, to be real clear on. And these are developed, in many cases, over a lifetime. But it's important for clarity. You're going to be a leader. Okay, we come back to that list. And in my mind, the leadership mindset begins with Starting out and understanding what it is to be a good follower and then being a good follower. Okay? Leaders take ownership. They don't let go. They, they make sure they bring about solutions and take make the most of, of the opportunities. You adopt a no-excuses mindset. That's it. Right? There are reasons, but excuses nobody, nobody wants to hear. Early task, define reality, help people understand where they're at and that you know where they're at, okay, and lead with values. And I would say boil down, from my experience, this is kind of the, the, the kernel around which strong leadership exp gets expressed, okay? And so if you take, if you take that, that framework, and you start to think about some of the notable failures around us, how to, how to avoid them. Okay, so pull from the news, just any of a number. Let's look at the, the, uh, the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. Anybody take ownership there? Did anybody look across the lines and say, well, you know, I'm responsible for this. But we could be poisoning people, and I gotta do something, and I gotta hold on to that, and I gotta make sure that I'm effective. Well, but I'm lower than you are. Doesn't matter. It's an act of leadership. Okay? It's an act of leadership. And you don't really have to be in a position of leadership to act like a leader, to bring about an effective result. When I think of what happened in that town, I gotta tell you. I, I want to cry. 
it is, it, it, it hits me emotionally in a way that I just cannot believe anywhere in the world such a thing could happen. I can logically understand how they got into that situation, and I can logically see, you know, how you can fail. Where's the leadership? One of the experts that uh, talked about it said, you know, if you wanted to keep a population down, you couldn't find a more effective way. Just put lead in the wall. What a terrible, terrible thing to happen in our country. Where is the leadership? Who took ownership? Or here, try another one. Do you do all remember Bridgegate? Right? Bridge Gazi, I think that's been referred to, right? In New Jersey, where, you know, political operatives. I think it was a deputy chief of staff of Governor Chris Christie came up with this great idea. We're going to shut down lanes of traffic on the George Washington Bridge into Manhattan from New Jersey. Unannounced, we're going to squeeze four lanes into one and create this enormous traffic jam. Enormous trouble for people. Were those people good followers? Is that good followership? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm for the governor, and we're going to penalize the governor's opposition here. All right? What's the followership? And you know what? I, I don't want to hear the excuses. When you're the leader, it's your job to have a broad view. I mean, do you want followers like that? What about your leadership attracts people who would do such a thing? Okay? And we're, you know, none of us are perfect. So I'm going to go back. I mean, even in, even in, in my company's core values, we don't say we're perfect. We don't say we don't make mistakes. But these for us, we live these, they are in some sense aspirational. Okay? But we're real clear on it. We're not saying we're perfect. People make mistakes. But you look back on, on it, and as a leader, you take ownership. You are responsible. You make sure nothing falls through the cracks. You make sure that that white space between functions, all right, is covered. Okay? So, uh, from my perspective, The leadership mindset, one way of getting at it, one way of sustaining it. Okay? And lives do depend on leadership. Your life as a leader depends on it, and the lives of those who follow it. Okay? Lives depend on it. So, for you, I hope that in your leadership path, that you lead as though your life.